this morning, Michael Jackson, not guilty on all counts. So Jackson's lead attorney, Tom Mesereau, live on the victory and the party overnight at Neverland. And Jackson's journey. Michael Jackson, not guilty, all ten counts. Good morning, Jim. Good morning, Robin. What a difference an hour makes in the life of Michael Jackson. He came to court facing terrible charges, charges that drained him of health and spirit. And then moments later, vindication, finally going home to Neverland to sleep, unburdened by the prospect of prison. A party at Neverland. Jackson family and attorneys celebrating complete victory immediately after the verdict. Lead Jackson attorney Tom Mesereau smiling broadly in full view of 300 fans outside the gates who were thrilled by the win, but disappointed Jackson made no personal appearance. We asked everybody to leave the area. Mesereau's first public comment after the verdict, a quick declaration. Justice was done. A man's innocent, he always was. Inside court, there were tears in every corner from two of the jurors, Mother Catherine Jackson. Jackson's attorney Susan Yu was sobbing and next to her the defendant dabbing his eyes. ABC's Taina Hernandez was watching not ten feet away. He started to cry more and more with each not guilty. There were more tears at one point. He even put both hands to his eyes to, to stop the flow. Not guilty ten times. In fact, the jury confirmed, despite all the familiar faces like Jay Leno, Chris Tucker, and Macaulay Culkin, it was the woman who covered her face that sunk the prosecution case. The accuser's mother could not be believed, and her kids, who accused Jackson of child molestation, could not be trusted either. Some jurors said the mom made them feel uncomfortable. The mother, when she looked at me and snapped her fingers a few times, and she says, you know how our culture is, and winks at me. I thought, no, that's not the way our culture is. <laughs> it was a clear-cut verdict. Victory for Michael Jackson, a rebuke for the prosecution. Diane? All right, Jim, we thank you so much. Now we turn to the Michael Jackson jurors, the people who gave him his freedom. Joining us now, jury foreman Paul Rodriguez, also jurors L.A. Cook, Tammy Bolton, Melissa Harrard, Michael John Stevens, and alternate juror Joseph Castello. And again, we thank you all for coming in. It's a long night of flying, and we're grateful to you. Okay, first question. Second thoughts. Anybody here? No second, no second thoughts. thoughts. Did you ever, any one of you, raise your hand if you did, did any one of you ever think guilty? That came up quite a bit. But uh, after weighing the evidence and lack of, uh, we realized that um, there wasn't enough, enough evidence there to prosecute him. I wanted to ask about the mother, and, and, and you, Ms. Cook, specifically talked about her. You said at one point that she was sort of waving oh, her she, finger at you. And she snapped. Show she, me what she did. Yeah. Just like that, and you don't snap your fingers at a jury, you snap your fingers to get a dog to mind you. She would look at the jury and then snap her fingers and say, you know, this is the way it should be. It should and be right in our faces. Yeah. Yes. That was very intimidating because I was directly, Mike and I were directly across from the witnesses. And she would turn right to us like she's just, you know. But Melissa, what did that of, say to you? I mean, apart from how it made you feel, what did that say to you about what who she was and the testimony she gave? Um, her testimony, a, a lot of the parts of her testimony, I wanted to just break out laughing, but I couldn't. You know, it, her, uh, um, she was up and down, up and down, and the parts that I felt that she should have been more, you know, more emotional about, she wasn't. It, so it's just not credible, you're saying? In the beginning, pictures we saw of her when she was uh, did the Michael Jackson rebuttal thing, uh, she had her hair done, she had makeup on, and she was the most attractive woman. When she came into court, she looked like Mother Teresa after a bad brain. Bad. <laughs> meaning, meaning, meaning. She looked drained. Her hair was straight. She didn't have any makeup on. So you on. thought that was false she was trying or? to play. She was trying to be pitiful to us. I felt. But but what does this have to do with her son's testimony? I mean, how, what did, did you do? You worry in any way? Do you worry that how you felt about her in some way influenced how you felt about his testimony? Did you feel no. he was lying? <laughs> did you feel the son was lying? Um, I yeah. thought he was going to answer. Go ahead, Mike. Um, yeah, there, there were there were times you could tell, but I mean, it all had to go back to the evidence. So I mean, it's like right there, the evidence. You know, it's, you have to go beyond a reasonable doubt. 
kids. I don't think the mother inflicted good values in her kids, and that made me have a hard time believing anybody in the family. Big question about celebrity. As we know, Thomas Sneddon came out and said the thing he'd learned about this was celebrity, celebrity influences. Are you sure? Are you sure that this gigantically renowned guy walking in a room had no influence at all? We talked about that right. when we first started um, the, the trial. Mm -hmm. And when we went into deliberations, that came up. We talked about that quite intensively, I think. And uh, we all felt that we have to look at this man just like we would anybody else, you know, just anyone off the street, anyone in particular, you know, just not looking at him as a celebrity. In fact, as the trial was going mm -hmm. on, we really didn't uh, pay much attention to him. Once in a while, you would look at him to see his demeanor, to see what he was, yeah. at certain questions or testimony that oh. was being presented. But At first, it was kind of intimidating. Uh, somewhat. I mean, to be honest, it was. But for sitting there for four months and watching him every day, and I came to realize that, you know, he's a person. He's a human. And to me, that just the celebrity status just went out. He's a he's a just another person. You study his face, any of you, at All the moment the, the not guilty verdict came in? Well, I kind of lost see? it there. What do you mean? I mean, I was crying because oh, yes. I was watching him. <laughs> I was we busy. Well, it started because... Um, um, the other lawyer for Michael Jackson lost it. When she lost it, I lost it. Because she was so, throughout the whole trial, she would look at the witnesses, yes. not move. She would just stare at them the whole time. She never slept. And um, she was always so alert and everything. And then to see, my gosh, her emotions just come pouring out. I, uh, that was just, oh. Any of the rest of you see anything in his face at that moment? What did you see? He looked over at us. In yeah. fact, uh, I made eye contact with him when the last part of the verdict was read. And he kind of just mouthed. He didn't openly say it, but he just kind of like said, you know. To me, too. Mm -hmm. And there were some tears, I yeah, guess. He yeah. you could tell yeah, he was crying. Yeah, he was crying. a little bit. Yeah, I, I want to ask, and again, I know I, I know what I'm wondering in here when I ask this, Joseph, and you're, uh, that you're an alternate, you're a college student, you, but you listen to every single part of, of this testimony. And everybody always thought, because they were surprised there were no more African Americans on the jury. Everyone always wondered if it would have been any different. I mean, not everyone wondered, but I guess people who, who assume sort of racial stereotypes. Just want to know from you how you felt about this verdict all the way going through so that everybody out there can hear that. Well, when it first started, I felt really bitter because I was the only black and African American. I wasn't even a juror. I was the ultimate. That's what really made me mad. But then when it came to the end where we had to leave, I, I decided myself because I, I developed friendship throughout the whole 20 jurors that, um, that you just need to... I, I, I trusted him. I really did trust him. And when I left, I, I thought to myself that that um, whatever verb that they come up with, I'll, I'll stand 100% behind them because I know that they'll do the right thing. We had a 100 page instructions, I'm pretty sure you, it's a tight fit. You don't have to go by what the judge says. Right. The second, but one of the things you've talked about surprised some people is that in your own family you have someone who is a registered sex offender, and you said that this gave you more understand, more fairness in the case. They, that was rather misquoted. I have a grandson that was 18, was out with a bunch of boys streaking. He was the only one that was 18. And someone dared him to flash instead of streak. He flashed, he got caught, and that's a uh, felony. And so for the next four, at, from the, and he was 18, and that's his sex offense. I want to talk about a final word here about all of you together and uh, a quick word from Melissa Vacan and also from Michael. Y you were the read back guy. Yeah. I watched yesterday. Each of you had an assignment <laughs> and you read back pages of the Almost judges. Almost 100 pages. Almost 100 pages yeah. of the judges' testimony. But at the end of the day, can we assume the jurors are like this where they come to respect each other? They raise their hands, they don't argue? Yeah. What happened here? We did, and if we got out of hand, Paul was there to ring the bell, or whoever had the bell, they would ring the bell, 
When they had enough. We had to ring that bell about three or four times. We did pretty good, I think. We only used the timer once. Keeping things under control. Three minutes. Well, you're much better behaved than all of us in Good Morning America. <laughs>
you know, exciting and, and terrifying all at the same time because it's such a huge uh, responsibility. Uh, but that was why I took it on. You know, Michael was such a huge part of my career and life. We were friends for 20 years before he passed, since I was seven. Um, so it's an opportunity for me to give back a little bit to, to, to his legacy. It's such a big part of his legacy and to, to make sure as much as I can that it's done right and that it really represents uh, his essence. I never forgot one moment of what Michael did to me, but I was psychologically and emotionally completely unable and, and unwilling to understand that it was sexual abuse. So what are you alleging that he actually did? He sexually abused me from seven years old until 14. I, I know it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult and personal question, but can you be more specific? Because you're accusing someone who is deceased of criminal activity. Yeah. So I need you to be a little more specific. Uh, did he perform sexual acts on you? Did he force you to perform sexual acts on him? What was the nature of the abuse? Yes, exactly what you said. He performed sexual acts on me and forced me to perform sexual acts on him. Did, when you testified in 2005 mm -hmm. and you took the stand and you raised your right hand and you yeah. swore under oath that nothing sexual ever happened between you and Michael Jackson, yeah. why did you lie? You know, I said what I understood and I said what I was able to say from seven years old, from day one of the abuse. Michael told me that we loved each other and that this was love, that this was a, an expression of our love. And then you'd follow that up with, you know, but if you ever tell anyone what we're doing, both of our lives and our careers will be over. Um, when I was 11, when the first uh, trial was going on, the criminal investigation in 93, mm -hmm. Um, he would call me every day and role play and, and, and tell me the same sort of things and also tell me then that if anyone ever thought that we did these things, any of these sexual things, that both of us would go to jail. There was no money, there was no, you must lie. Michael, when, when he would talk to me before these things were going on and he would call me every day as these things were happening, it was complete manipulation and brainwashing. It wasn't any sense of the truth on the phone. He would role play with me and train me for these scenarios. When I say his name to you this morning, what do you think of? Heartbreak, pain, anger, and compassion. There's, um, you know, there's no excuse for what he did to me, and I believe many others, but, um, but he was a troubled man and every effect has its cause. You know, the image that one presents to the world um, is not the whole explanation of who someone is. You know, Michael Jackson was, yes, an incredibly talented artist and a, with an incredible gift. He was many things, and he was also a pedophile and a child sexual abuser. What's your takeaway? I think the case is a travesty. First of all, Wade Robson was my first witness in Michael Jackson's criminal trial. And I had to think long and hard about whether we even needed to put on a defense case because the cross-examination of prosecution witnesses went very well. But I decided to put on a case. And when you do that, you want to start strong and you want to end strong. I started with one of my strongest witnesses for Michael Jackson, Wade Robson. He was adamant that he had never been touched, never been molested, never been abused, directly or indirectly. I called his mother and sister as witnesses to corroborate what he said, because they traveled on these tours too. And to have him suddenly reverse course so radically, years after Michael Jackson has passed away and can't speak up for himself, is outrageous. So I don't think he has a case. I think this is a money grab, like so much of Michael Jackson's unfortunate life. Uh, everybody seemed to have their hand out in one way or another. And I just think it's, it's ridiculous. Safe Chuck, I put in the same category. He didn't testify in the criminal trial, but he signed declarations. As oh, I, he as did. I, he as, did. As, as I recall, he signed declarations, made statements that he had never been touched. Now, and both, these are declarations under oath? That's my understanding. I don't, uh, I haven't but seen Wade these. Wade Robson did swear under oath. Ray, Wade Robson, I put him on as my witness, right. and he was subjected to a withering cross-examination by Prosecutor Ron Zonin from the Santa Barbara District Attorney's Office. I mean, Ron went after him, and Ron's a good prosecutor. He would not waver. 
He was adamant he was never touched. And my understanding was Safe Chuck repeatedly said the same thing. So to suddenly come back years later and say we want millions of dollars, we were brainwashed, we had repressed memory, we didn't face the facts, we didn't deal with reality, I just find very, very suspicious. And also these leaks about Michael so-called paying off $200 million to other so-called victims. Uh, first of all, the timing is curious. They were leaked. Or, or at least given to the, the media right before the hearing was scheduled to take place. It's been continued now till May. And so that's curious. That reminds me of, of attorney Larry Feldman's playbook in the early 90s when he represented someone named Chandler who sued Michael Jackson. And Michael was represented by Howard Weitzman, who represents the estate now. And Howard signed a settlement agreement where he reportedly paid close to $20 million. It was a confidential agreement, but that then got leaked, and it ended up coming into the criminal courtroom when I was defending Michael. Not the amount. The amount was not, not allowed to go before the jury, but the fact that he settled was. Howard Weitzman represented Michael Jackson in that case. He settled, a, he settled that case for a reported $20 million. He signed the settlement agreement. He appeared at the press conference to announce it. And I, I don't think it's a good idea that he's the lead counsel defending these cases, because I think it sends a message that the estate might settle. But nevertheless, Larry Feldman, the plaintiff's lawyer in that case, was periodically leaking damaging information out, disturbing information out, and then there'd be silence, and then he would leak it out again. And I think these plaintiff's lawyers in the Robson Safechuck case are borrowing from his playbook. They're putting pressure on Mr. Branca and Mr. Weitzman uh, to think carefully about whether they want this thing to continue. Hasn't and Mr. Weitzman claimed that he didn't settle that lawsuit? He's claimed he was against it, but okay. his signature is right on the document. All you right. can find it on the internet, and he was at the press conference to announce, announce the, uh, the settlement. So I don't believe for a second he was against it, but he says he was. Um, let people be the judge of his behavior. I, I, but I think having him as lead counsel is a tremendous mistake, and I think it sends the wrong message. I hope these cases get thrown out. I think they're bogus. Do I you think, think it's all right to actually bring, <clears throat> I mean, is there an issue in terms of bringing a lawsuit for sexual abuse after somebody has passed? I, I think it's, it's very troubling because the person uh, who's passed is not there to give their position, is not there to say, this is, this is silly, is not there to cooperate with the defense lawyers. It, 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 there's something very wrong about it, but my understanding is under the law, you can sue an estate for a valid claim. Now, the defense is claiming it's filed too late. Apparently, technically, they have been filed too late. But as we saw in the Catholic Church sexual abuse cases, judges will make, make you know, exceptions for people who claim repressed memory, uh, that they were in denial, that they suffered the Apparently normal Apparently, that's effects. quite common with sexual abuse, that there is science to, and, and anecdotal evidence as well, that when somebody has been sexually abused, that sometimes they, it takes them 30 years to come forward or, and whatnot. But we were discussing this before, and in terms of the Catholic Church, those allegations are also being made against the Catholic Church for their actual behavior. The state in this in instance didn't do anything proactive to, to move, you know, and to hide. Mm -hmm. At least they were not even being charged with that. That's not the allegation. So we have a bit of a difference here when you're suing the Catholic Church over molestation. Priests that they were in charge of, priests that they moved around, priests that they were aware of were abusing people isn't quite the same thing as suing somebody's estate. Because basically, in the case of Michael Jackson, you're suing Michael Jackson, not I, his estate, uh, you know, and, I'm, I'm for not, his behavior. I'm not in that case. I don't know a lot of the details. I think they tried to sue his corporation as well. Um, but nevertheless, I think the case is a travesty. If it's not thrown out, however, I don't believe Mr. Brank or Mr. Weitzman have the guts to try it. I don't think we're going to see these witnesses going into court in a public forum giving this type of salacious testimony, the kind of testimony I had to deal with in the criminal case. I don't think they have the guts to try it. Is it a question not of guts, but rather of protecting the entity of the estate so that, um, that it's not harmed by yet another trial? Well, the problem is that if you settle it, you're not only inviting other people to make similar claims, uh, unfortunately, it sends a message that perhaps Michael Jackson did this kind of thing. Now, when I got involved in Michael Jackson's criminal case, I had a jury consultant do some surveys of attitudes in northern Santa Barbara County where I had never tried a case before. And those surveys showed that the one thing that, that disturbed people the most, whether they appeared to be pro-prosecution or pro-defense, was the fact that he had paid millions of dollars to settle cases. So if the word gets out that the estate paid millions of dollars to resolve these cases, it will have a damaging effect. But the estate might decide that the damaging effects of that are not as severe as seeing these witnesses testify one after another to salacious testimony, even if they're lying.